Welcome to the No BS Spiritual Book Club's live streaming interview series, where leading new thought teachers, speakers, and authors share the intimate stories behind the 10 best spiritual books that inspired them the most on their spiritual journey. From well-known classics to hidden gems you might never have heard of, the No BS Spiritual Book Club saves you time and money by sharing reliable recommendations from those who've walked the path before you. The No BS Spiritual Book Club, the only No BS guide to the best spiritual books to inspire your own journey of self-discovery. Here's your host, founder of the No BS Spiritual Book Club, Sandy Sedgebeer. Hello and welcome. Joining me today to share the 10 best spiritual books that inspired her life journey is painter, poet and musician Marlena Seven Bremner, whose work explores esoteric themes arising from her study and her practice of hermeticism, alchemy, magic, astrology and mythology. Her paintings have been exhibited in group and solo exhibitions along the West Coast and internationally, and she's also the author of two books, Hermetic Philosophy and Creative Alchemy, The Emerald Tablet, The Corpus Hermeticum, and The Journey Through the Seven Spheres, and The Hermetic Marriage of Art and Alchemy, Imagination, Creativity, and The Great Work. Marlena Seven Bremner, welcome. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you so much for having me on the show. Now, I know you prefer to be called Seven, and that's a very unusual name. How did you come by that? Uh, well, it was kind of a long process, but I always thought it sounded like a beautiful name. And there was a time in my life where I felt like my given name, which I really love and I think is very beautiful, Marlena, uh, felt too soft and too watery. And I wanted something um, a little more neutral or even more masculine and, you know, a little bit more active feeling. And the number seven felt that way to me at the time. And it had a lot of spiritual significance, as it does in many cultures and in many traditions. So I was aware of that. And then at a certain point, I also realized that my given middle name, Suzanne, um, has seven letters, as do my first and last name. So 777. And... Um, Anyway, yeah, I just decided to take it on as a way to shift my own energy, and it really, really worked. I love it. Did you find when you started adopting the name and using it all the time that everything around you changed? I mean, numerologists would say yeah. that it will. It certainly did. Yeah, it yeah. changed everything. Yeah. Wow. Have you ever spoken to a numerologist to find out the, you know, the frequency, what it's bringing into your life? You know, I have, but it's been a long time and I don't recall exactly what they said. Um, but I think of the number seven as a number of wholeness. Um, and also I think about the seven planetary spheres in traditional astrology and um, hermeticism. And so it represents sort of a completion of these seven energies or, you know, within the psyche, these seven archetypes. I think it's beautiful. Really Thank beautiful. You. So tell me about your relationship with books. Well, it's been a long one. Um, <laughs> I grew up in a house full of books, uh, thanks to my parents, especially my dad. And so books were just always around. And, you know, my dad would often take me to book sales and bookstores. And um, they were a big part of my childhood. And I was really into mysteries and you know, Nancy Drew and the Hardy Boys and um, the Cat Who books and, you know, later into more like spooky things, Anne Rice and Stephen King and stuff before I got into reading about spirituality and in, in my teens. Do you remember the first spiritual book you read? Um, I don't remember exactly which one was first, but there were a few that I read around the same time. And I think I was about 16. And one of them was The Fire from Within by Carlos Castaneda. And say what you will about the man, his books are excellent and were a beautiful introduction into um, the spiritual domains. And um, another one was by Paramahansa Yogananda. And I'm blanking on the title at the moment, um, but it's basically his, auto oh, his autobiography, that's yeah. the one. Yeah. So were you hooked from that moment? 
Oh yes. Oh yes. It opened up a whole world and um, yeah, started everything for me. Well, your first book, you will not be surprised to hear that it comes up again and again and again. It is such a beautiful, beautiful classic. And it is The Prophet by Khalil Gibran, published in 1923. Tell us about the impact this book had on you. Well, it's one that's kind of been a slow simmer over the years. You know, it's been on my shelf for a long time. I don't remember when I first got it. It was probably in my 20s. And every once in a while, I just pick it up and look for a chapter that's relevant to what I'm going through. And there's always just beautiful gems of wisdom. Um, you know, chapters on love, on time, on joy and sorrow. And there's just, it's beautiful. These uh, lovely vignettes, you know, very full of wisdom. So every time I pick it up, it has something to offer me, mm. no matter how much time goes by. Do you remember when you first read it? No, I think it was probably in my 20s. Yeah. 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 It's, uh, I, I see it as a guidebook for life. Oh, yeah. 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 Yeah, my favorite chapter is probably the one on love. Mm. Yeah, I, I like that, but I like the one on parenting. I think that's really love. important. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. So book number two, a little bit different. True Hallucinations, being oh, yeah. an account of the author's extraordinary adventures in the devil's paradise by Terence McKenna, <laughs> 1993. <laughs> yeah, I picked this one just because of the impact that it had on me and on my spiritual path. And, you know, it's a lot about psychedelic adventures in the Amazon and in Kathmandu and um, his experiences with mushrooms and ayahuasca and DMT. And as a teenager reading this and listening to Terence McKenna's talks, it really just blew my mind wide open to incredible realms of possibility and exploration. And, you know, for a while I was very interested in being a psychonaut myself and exploring the psychedelic world. And um, that definitely opened up a lot for me, um, especially in my 20s when I had the opportunity to try DMT, uh, which was the only time I tried it. And it really um, broke my whole world right open and kind of reset my relationship to the spiritual realm in general. Uh, because before that, I had had kind of a sort of superficial um, understanding of spirituality, where it was very much about the upper realms. You know, I didn't want to have anything to do with what was hidden inside of me or the body or any of that. It was very much about um, being out of the body. And that experience brought me right down into the root of everything that I really needed to be addressing in my life. And so for years afterward, I had to unpack all of that material that I hadn't been able to deal with before. And um, yeah, it helped me to be a more whole and integrated human being. So I kind of see true hallucinations as the seed that was planted and at an early age that led to that experience that was so life changing. Did you have any frightening hallucinations? Oh, it was very frightening. And that's why it was so powerful. Yeah, because I had expected, you know, contacting God and, you know, beautiful experience of divine higher beings or something. And what I got instead was, I can only equate it to the alchemical concept of the prima materia, which is just complete chaos and undifferentiated energy. All of the elements, everything existing simultaneously, all at once for eternity. And um, so it was very hard to make sense of. And in the moment, I had been completely um, separated from my sense of ego and my sense of self. So during the experience, it wasn't like my personality as Marlena was having this experience. It was just awareness of the experience. And so that was really powerful for me too, to understand the separation between pure awareness and my identity and my ego. Mm, wow. Well, book number three is The World Is As You Dream It, following on quite nicely, Teachings from the Amazon and Andes by John Perkins, published in 1994. Yeah, I am. Um, in my late teens, I became very interested in shamanism, um, especially that practiced by the Amazonian tribes in Ecuador and Peru and Brazil. And um, 
was just really fascinated and pretty obsessed with it. So I read everything I could about New Age shamanism and accounts from um, shamans in the Amazon. And this was one of the best, it's written by a white guy, but there's a lot of conversations with indigenous shamans and so much wisdom is shared within it. And the key message being that we're dreaming our reality, you know? And so the way that we're dreaming our reality is affecting everything that we're experiencing personally and collectively. And so um, the big mess message um, that the shamans were giving to John Perkins was that the West is having a nightmare, you know, and we need to change our dream. So that had a big impact on me, just seeing the world in that way. And there were other books that were um, pivotal in that regard as well, understanding that our imagination affects reality, you know, like uh, Shakti Gawain, and creative visualization was another book that I read early on. Mm, yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, John Perkins' experience really changed him. And, you know, he's still doing great work mm -hmm. endlessly. Um, let's move on to book four, which is another one that comes up very, very often. Memories, Dreams, Reflections by Carl mm -hmm. Jung, published in 1961. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that one I was introduced to, well, actually I'd read some other work by Carl Jung first, some of his more dense academic stuff about psychology and alchemy. And then someone gave me this one and it's such a personal account of his childhood and his school years and um, practices with clients and um, really, I don't know. I think they're just a lot of, um, descriptions of patients that he was working with and their dreams and their neuroses and the way that he analyzed them that were really influential to me in thinking about the psyche and the spiritual process and spiritual growth. Um, yeah, and also if I could read a quote, there was one that stood out to me that I thought I would share. Um, and many people are probably familiar with this, but um, he says, nowadays we can see as never before that the peril which threatens all of us comes not from nature, but from man, from the psyches of the individual and the mass. The psychic aberration of man is the danger. Everything depends upon whether or not our psyche functions properly. If certain persons lose their heads nowadays, a hydrogen bomb will go off. So I think about that a lot and I have throughout my life just that you know, these hidden things that we have within us that we're projecting outward and seeing yeah. as evil in others or the bad in others, rather than um, acknowledging it within ourselves and integrating it so that it becomes an ally um, and something that we can use to our own advantage, but also to better the world around us. Um, and that really seems to me to be true, that that's the root cause of the ills of our collective experience. Yeah. Um, you know, it's true, I think, that we spend an awful lot of time, you know, focusing on the impact the world around us is having on us and not so much on the impact we're having on the world around us. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, you said you had many, many aha moments in this book. Um, obviously, that was one. Can you recall any others? Uh, well, towards the end of the book, he talks about the confrontation with the shadow and how that sort of necessitates a conflict within the psyche and that it can be resolved through symbols and particularly mandalas and art. And um, that really was an aha moment for me dealing with my own, you know, mental health stuff at the time in my early twenties, as many of us do, um, sort of understanding that art could be a gateway to healing and to integration. So was that when you started painting or did that come much later? It was right around that time. I was reading a lot of Jung. I was going through a very difficult time. It was following that DMT experience that just shattered me and left me feeling like a shadow of myself, like I didn't know what to do. And I started teaching myself how to oil paint and processing things that were coming up for me from the depths, you know, and allowing them to express themselves on the canvas. And then what I would see would be so strange and interesting. And I don't show a lot of that work these days, 
uh, cause it was very much just about my own healing and process. Mm. Um, but it would speak back to me in this way that would allow me to sort of peel back the layers and understand more and more about myself and what was going on and how to heal from it. So it was a really beautiful process. And I'm, I'm just grateful to his work and, mm. and opening that up. Yeah. Book number five, Rhythms of Recovery, Integrative Medicine for PTSD and Complex Trauma, the second edition by Dr. Leslie E. Korn. That, and it's interesting because you're saying the second edition, but the first edition was only published in 2023. So it's being updated quickly. Oh, no, the, that's the new edition is the 2023. Ah, yeah. When was it first published then? I want to say 2015. Oh, okay. It was a hard book to track down. Very yeah. hard to try and find it on the internet. So tell us about this particular 2013 book. is when it was first published. Okay. Yeah. And I started working for Dr. Korn and working with her. She was my teacher for polarity therapy, which is a hands-on energy modality. And I was working first as an intern and then as an employee for many years um, through my 20s. And... This was also during that same time where I was going through a lot and exploring art and working for her and learning about energy medicine and the body and healing. And this book really um, gets into the disruption of the rhythms of the body that happen with trauma and how to heal from that. And it's written, it's geared towards the practitioner, but it's also written in such a way that the layman can read it. Um, and get a lot out of it, which is why I thought I would recommend it because I think oftentimes, and it was the case for me, when we're on the spiritual path, it's easy to forget how important the body is and how much that affects the psyche and our ability to relate to the spiritual world and um, how it's all connected. You know, it's in the hermetic sense, everything is one. You can't separate spirit and matter, even though we do conceptually, um, they're really a unity. And so spirit is infused in everything material and understanding what's going on within the body can have such an impact on our ability to experience that to the fullest. Do so. you still practice? Polarity therapy? Yeah. No, I, I finished all my training and I was ready to start a practice. And then I realized that what I really wanted to do was um, be an artist. And so I integrated everything that I had learned into my art because I decided that it was, I would rather teach through symbols and writing than practice and be like, you know, a therapist seeing clients every week. And you can meet more people. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, book number six, a classic since 1928. This book has been coming into my field a lot lately. Uh, the Secret Teachings of All Ages by Manly P. Hall. Yeah, this one, um, I was graced to have a full-size signed copy of this in my studio for about a year from a dear friend of mine. And, you know, I would just have it on a stand and leave it open to a page because there's beautiful illustrations in there, just really amazing in the full copy. Um, and there's mid-sized copies, too, that have the color plates. And just leave it open as a source of meditation while I'd be working in the studio. And every once in a while, I'd go sit down in front of it and flip through the pages and just be completely um, awestruck at the immense amount of work and research that went into this. And the fact that I think he wrote it or it was published when he was 27. So that in itself was pretty inspiring to me that someone would be able to um, retain that much wisdom at such, such an early age and transmit it in such an eloquent and beautiful way. So I highly recommend that one to be on everyone's shelves who's interested in anything esoteric because it just covers all the bases. Well, a little synchronicity around this book. Um, I've had a friend staying with me from Italy, an American friend, and she was telling me that she is looking for this book. She's looking for the coffee table version, which must be, you know, with the beautiful, uh, you know, colour plated, etc. And so she's always looking in every bookshop she comes to. And then I looked at your list and I read to her what you had said on your list that, 
you had that book <laughs> and you'd been able to spend a lot of time with it. She was very, very jealous. How interesting. <laughs> mm, yeah. Funny that it came up, you know, yeah. the same day I was looking at your list. Yeah. 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 That's how it happens, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it is. <laughs> so book number seven, The Corpus Hermeticum. And there are many different versions of this. Um, you can tell us in a moment your favorite version, but that's quite a that's quite a book to be uh, diving into. How did you find it? Um, well, I'd become interested in alchemy through reading Carl Jung and um, also through studying with um, Dr. Korn um, and her writings about the caduceus and um, it was many years later, though, that I actually started reading the Corpus Hermeticum, and I'd read other um, texts that are said to be hermetic, like the Kabbalion, which many people have heard of. And while that, you know, certainly is hermetic in a sense, it's not a traditional text. Um, it was written in the earlier part of the um, 20th century. So it's a more modern text and interpretation of ancient teachings. Um, and I, I recommend that as well. I think it's beautiful. But the Corpus Hermeticum is the kind of the source for the Hermetic teachings. And it's written, there's 17 treatises or tracts, and they're written as dialogues between a teacher and a disciple. And usually the teacher is um, the divine figure, Hermes Trismegistus, or thrice greatest, and his various students. And um, everything from topics about time and energy to the cosmology of everything that exists, the organization of the cosmos, the relationship between humanity and God or humanity and the divine. Um, yeah, so much wisdom. And it, it certainly is not an easy read um, to begin with. And that was part of the inspiration for writing my book was sort of a way to introduce people to these ideas um, and hopefully inspire them to read it because I think it's very worthwhile. Yeah, I think everybody who knows about this book is intrigued by it, but, you know, actually reading it is another thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, really they should be, each track should be meditated upon and sort of contemplated over a period of time. It's not something that is just going to be easy to take in all at once. So did it, you know, what kind of impact did it have on you? Well, um, it was pretty profound for me because I'd been studying occultism and alchemy for a while before I read the Corpus Hermeticum. So to me, it was sort of like, wow, okay, this is where all of this is rooted. This is where it comes from and or a lot of it anyway. And um, to me, that was really meaningful to be able to get in touch with these original teachings and have that as a foundation for my own practice. Um, and to put into context everything else that I'd been learning that, you know, is written in the centuries since then. But, yeah. mm. What does the word alchemy mean to you? Alchemy to me um, signifies the union between the above and the below, or the union between the within and the without, um, the different sides of our being that tend to be opposed and pull us in different directions and the art of being able to bring those together. And <clears throat> the way we do that is through, um, through the imagination and through unifying things that are external to us with things that are inside of us. And um, being able to integrate the physical and the spiritual worlds. Mm. That's, that's a beautiful description. I mean, so many words have lost their meanings. They've been dumbed down, you know, they've been loaded up with um, other interpretations, you know, like, oh, it's magic, at all. Um, it's, it's a shame, but it, yeah, yeah, you've described it perfectly. Yeah. Well, there's a lot more to it, but that's yeah. the essence of it, I think. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, we're going to take a short break now. Um, you're listening to a No BS Spiritual Book Club interview and sharing the 10 books that had the biggest influence on her life journey. Is painter, poet, musician, and author of books on hermetic philosophy and creative alchemy, Seven Bremner. We'll be back in a few moments. Om Times TV. 
Maya Angelou once said that there is no greater agony than bearing an untold story inside you. I'm Sandy Sedgbeer, and when I'm not hosting On Times Media's flagship radio show, What Is Going On, and the No BS Spiritual Book Club, I help people share their untold stories. Books are my life, my joy, and my passion, and there is no greater reward than helping aspiring writers get their books out of their heads and into the hands of those who are waiting to read them. If you feel that you have a book in you, but don't know where to begin, visit sedgebeer.com, click on the Work With Me tab, and find out how my experience helping others tell their stories might be just what you've been looking for. That's sedgebeer.com, S-E-D-G-B-E-E-R.com. Imagine becoming a super influencer. Reinvent yourself. Invest in your brand and then manifest your success with a robust, spheric approach. Own Times Media and Broadcasting offers a unique and multifaceted way to become the spiritual and conscious influencer you deserve to be by putting your message across our powerful platform with its proven record of integrity and excellence. Through our produced shows, Own Times offers the opportunity to become a social media TV personality, a radio show host, an Own Times magazine columnist, and a syndicated podcaster, all in one shot. By live streaming your show on Ohm Times TV and broadcasting it across the extensive Ohm Times radio and TV networks, you become more than a host. You become an ambassador and a force for positive change. Ohm Times. Open yourself to the possibilities. There are 16 million children struggling with hunger in America. That's one in five daughters, sons, neighbors, and classmates who don't know where their next meal is coming from. Yet billions of pounds of good food go to waste every year. It's time we do something about it. Feeding America is a nationwide network of food banks that helps provide meals to millions of kids and families in need. Visit feedingamerica.org to help them feed even more. Together, we can solve hunger. Together, we're Feeding America. Welcome back. Marlena Seven Bremner, book eight. Uh, you're going to have to help me here. You know, one of the one of the uh, challenges of this job is the number of names that I have to pronounce, and you know, the Brits have their own way of pronouncing names, so I often get it wrong. Book eight, Alchemy: The Poetry of Matter by Brian. Uh, I believe it's Cote Noir. Cote Noir. Okay, published in 2017, and this is described as an alchemical book rather than a book about alchemy. Yes, yes. Um, well, first of all, it's incredibly beautiful, the typesetting and the layout, and it's just full of quotes from different philosophers and alchemists over the ages and beautiful little diagrams and illustrations, and that alone makes it worth having. Um, but for me, it was really powerful because I'd already been exploring the connections between alchemy and creativity in my own work and doing a lot of writing about it and sort of the very, very beginnings of my books that I've written um, were coming together when I read his book. And so it was affirming for me because he does talk about alchemy in a creative sense and the relationship between um, the inner world and having some sort of physical practice as the root of alchemy, you know, whether that's working in a laboratory or working in some other medium, but having that connection with the physical world and being able to see things change and transform and transmute. So for me, that was um, the power of that book was just an affirmation. And also it's just a beautiful um, journey, alchemical journey that he takes you on. He really lays it all out in such a beautiful way. I love it when people bring new books that we've never heard of, you know, to the library and um, it just, you know, expands it. Um, how do you find these books? I mean, do they just come into your life? Do they drop off shelves? Does a friend <laughs> hand them to you? Well, a lot of times uh, people will tell me about them. They'll recommend them. Um, I had a good friend in Olympia who ran uh, Last Word Books and he would just set aside books for me and let me know that he had these like occult books that I should check out. And then I'd go in and say, oh yeah, I want all of them. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it, it would happen like that sometimes. Um, a lot of times 
I'd be reading a book and there'd be a reference to another book or I'd read through the bibliography and find things that stood out. Um, so yeah, usually it's an intuitive process or through other people that are very helpful and kind. So do you have a big library? Um, well, you can kind of see it behind me, but yes, I do have quite a few books and um, not enough space for them. <laughs> yeah, and are you an underliner or do you keep your books pristine? It depends. If the book is really precious, I really try not to underline and dog ear, but if it's a paperback and I'm studying it and referencing it a lot or, I'm, yeah, then tons of underlining, dog earing, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. But I find that helpful because then when I look back at it years later, I remember what was important to me at the time, you know? Yes. So that's yeah. really interesting. Yeah, yeah. So book number nine is The Penguin Dictionary of Symbols mm -hmm. by Jean Chevalier and Alain Gierbrandt, Gierbrandt, I'm not sure, 1997. Yeah, this is um, a reference book that has just been so wonderful to have over the years for um, it's just a dictionary of symbols, you know, but each passage is really detailed and draws on a lot of mythology from all around the world, many different cultures. And so it's very comprehensive. And um, I find sometimes books on symbols can be a little bit one-sided or, you know, um, limited to a certain cultural outlook. So this one has a really good breadth to it. And there's no images, but the richness of the descriptions is why I recommend it. And no images of the symbols. No, no, no. Wow. No. So can you get a good feel from the description? Well, often it'll just be, you know, like a certain type of tree or an animal or like a sword or, you know, very, people would know what these things are okay. in general. And I think okay. if not, he does, they do give descriptions. Um, yeah, but it's been essential for me just to be able to have a good reference book for symbols that opens up my imagination and can be really inspiring and um, connect the dots with synchronicities that come up. And, mm. Yeah. Well, book number 10 is Alchemy, the Medieval Alchemists and Their Royal Art by Johannes Fabricius, published in 1976. Yeah, this was another early book on alchemy that I, I read that was super inspiring for me, full of alchemical images, um, probably the most comprehensive set of alchemical images in one book that I've seen. And so anyone that's interested in alchemy as a spiritual um, process, I would highly recommend it. And it's written from a very psychological perspective, um, probably heavily in influenced by Jung and um, Silberer, but um, each of the images has just a beautiful description and it's written in such a way that it's an alchemical book itself because it's not written in a way that um, is totally obvious to the rational linear mind. You kind of have to let it soak in and affect you on a deeper level and contemplate the symbols. And I'll often just open it up at random and um, read a passage, contemplate the image, and usually that'll connect with something that I'm experiencing. So I use it as a, almost like a type of bibliomancy sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, and also as a reference for my own writing and understanding of alchemy. Yes, yeah, so it's the kind of book that you would not give away. Oh, um, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. Okay, well, that is your 10 books. Um, I'm very curious to know, you know, it's one thing to be inspired by Jung, um, but you've gone so deep into this study. You know, what has kept you, you know, moving deeper and deeper? You know, it's just something, it's just an impulse. It's just a drive, I suppose. Um, a curiosity, an endless curiosity um, to keep going deeper, to follow the threads. Um, and that's generally how everything that I do happens. It's just pulling on the threads, you know, like one symbol leads to another and that leads to this book and that book. And um, in order for me to understand things and to put them together and to integrate them, I write about them. And so that's how the books came together. Um, and the paintings are a similar 
thing. It's like to be able to process something external, <clears throat> externally in visual form um, allows me to see it from a different perspective and to have a different relationship with it. And then also to um, encapsulate a vision or a, an understanding in symbolic form so that other people can also receive that transmission. So you said that, um, that's, you know, you write about it and that's how the books came together. Did you know that you, as you were writing about it, that, you know, this was going to become a book or was it Not only later that you realized that? Not at first. At first it was just writing because it was a way for me to understand and integrate. And then at a certain point, I had a significant amount of material that all revolved around similar themes and I started to think about it as a book. And so to begin with, I had some different ideas for how the books were going to be um, written, what they were going to be about, and it just took some time for them to sort of synthesize into the forms that they took on. Um, it was probably, you know, close to seven years altogether that it took to write the books. That magic number. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> So, um, and you didn't have any difficulty finding a publisher? Well, um, that was just a very uh, um, beautiful kind of synchronicity, I guess. I had gone to the Esoteric Book Conference in Seattle um, that's put on by my dear friend, William Kiesel, and had a lovely conversation with the Inner Traditions um, Acquisitions Editor at his table. I got some books. And uh, he gave a talk, which I thought was excellent, about um, um, alchemy and surrealism and um, super inspiring to me. And years later, after I'd been working on the books for a while, I had decided to move to New Mexico to have more space and time to finish the books. And um, at that time, actually, it was one book, one very big book that I wanted to publish. And I was just curious about the publishing process. And I was like, who do I know in the publishing world that I could ask? And I thought of John Graham. So I contacted him and he was very interested in what I was working on. Uh, he was familiar with my art and had been following my work for many years. And um, so I sent him an outline and later I sent him some writing samples and that was that. He presented it to Inner Traditions and they accepted. So yeah, I didn't, I was very lucky. I didn't have to work very hard to get published, but um, in a sense, it was based on my other work that I'd been doing for years yeah. before that. Yeah. Well, Barbara Han Clow, who um, was the original acquisitions editor at Bear and Company, which is part of Inner Traditions now, really rates your work. It was she who told me about it. Yeah. I think you mentioned that. Yeah. 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 And she was. It's so funny because she was such a big influence on me um, as a teenager, reading her books about especially the Pleiadian agenda and the Pleiadian workbook. Yeah, yeah. she actually said it, I think it was on her 10 best list. Certainly oh. she mentioned you when she was doing her 10 best list on the show. So she gave oh. you a great shout out there. Oh, that's such an honor. <laughs> so tell me as a, as a lay person who doesn't know a huge amount about hermeticism, um, tell me what I will find in these books. What, what am I going to learn? in your versions that are, you say are simpler yeah. and easier to read than the originals? <laughs> well, a little simpler maybe. Yeah. Um, so the first book is really about hermetic philosophy and spirituality. And so it gives you an introduction to what hermeticism is, where it comes from, a little bit of the history of it, and also an introduction to the main um, hermetica, the texts that comprise um, the original hermetic transmissions. And so you get a sense of like where to look for certain things and what you're gonna find when you look in those texts. And then throughout the book, I have included, you know, quotations as examples to kind of illustrate um, how hermeticism and creative alchemy can help with the process of unlocking our highest and truest potential and to be our true authentic selves as co-creators in this reality that we're all experiencing. So one of the things that 
I found lacking when I was reading about alchemy and hermeticism were just full on chapters or large sections dedicated to each of the planets. So what I really wanted to do was to have a chapter devoted to each of the seven traditional planets. And so that's the journey through the seven spheres that makes up the last part of the book. And so, um, yeah, each chapter is just a very in-depth, but also meditative sort of read. Um, again, it's written in a way that you want to kind of let it soak in over time and refer back to it. And it's not really written in a way that, um, or intended to be read as just a quick read, you know, and mm. quick download, but something to be um, contemplated over time. Would um, amateur astrologers find anything um, interesting in the seven spheres? Oh, certainly. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, because, I mean, learning about the seven traditional planets, I think, would be really um, beneficial to an amateur astrologer. And I've also included a lot about the zodiac and um, just the hermetic conception of the cosmos in general, which um, really forms a lot of modern astrology as well. Mm. So um, you also cover the Emerald Tablet, and uh, I can imagine that people who don't know what that is, it sounds awfully seductive, you know, like something that has just been unearthed somewhere that has some kind of, you know, long forgotten wisdom. Tell us about the Emerald Tablet. Well, it's a legendary tablet, but it's um, been translated into many languages over the years, and it's very short and concise, and... Um, the way I like to describe it is that it's um, it basically tells us how the imagination, which I understand to be the one thing that's described in the Emerald Tablet, um, allows for the transmutations of all things, for miraculous things to occur, and to be able to unify the above and the below. And it's the source for the very well-known hermetic axiom that you hear all around, as above, so below. So that's where that's that um, axiom comes from. And it's said in a much more eloquent way in the text, um, that which is above comes from that which is below to accomplish the miracles of the one thing. I might be getting that slightly wrong, but it's, that's generally how it's written. Um, so yeah, it's um, a very simple exposition of the power of the imagination and of the power of creativity. And how, how does it help one with creativity? Well, if we understand ourselves to be um, reflections of the creator of all things, and that all of that happens through the image-making power of the mind, the imagination, and through the power of the word, then it's a very empowering thing to understand for oneself that our thoughts the way we speak and the way that we imagine things to be has an effect on the outer world. And, you know, if we think about the above and the below um, as the divine and that which is within us or as the without and the within um, or vice versa, the divine being within us and the without being the sort of external world where we project things outward, um, that relationship is really pivotal to living a truly authentic creative life and being able to um, employ the imagination to affect positive outcomes for ourselves and for the world. Are you familiar with the concept of Watiko? I don't think so. Um, Watiko is something f f from the Native American, but every culture has had something similar. It is <laughs> like a, a thought form. Um, it is like a, a mind virus, and it's uh, one that is very, quite negative. Mm -hmm. And um, Paul Levy, who's written books about this, says that, you know, we are all being impacted by this. Um, and a lot of people who don't really understand about creativity, um, you know, are finding that they're losing their mojo, if you like. You know, they're losing their hope. Um, there's so much chaos in the world, etc. There's so much bad news in the media. Um, and the antidote to Watiko is creativity. And if people understood that, you know, that creativity is, it is the wellspring. It is what is going to 
you know, what we're going to bring forth that is, is everything. And um, I just wondered if you had uh, any knowledge of that and how you felt about that. Well, now that you describe it, I think I have heard the term before. Um, and it also makes me think about the term egregore, which yes. is very similar. similar. Yeah, which yes. is like a psychic ener energy yes. or entity that's created yes. through yes. the collective um, mm -hmm. thoughts that are happening. And so, yeah, I, I find that super interesting. And also thinking about what's going on in the world and people watching the news and just being flooded with all of this negativity and very depressing information. And, you know, what happens when we just focus on what's happening right around us, you know, we don't see all of that. And on the one hand, it's important to be aware of that, but if we're letting it color the way that we see the world and the possibilities that we see for the world, then that's a really harmful thing. So there's, I think a fine balance between like maintaining some awareness of worldly events and what's happening, but also like focusing on the positive things that are happening in our communities and allowing those things to grow and flourish through the imagination and just imagining better possibilities. Mm. Well, like alchemy, I consider that word creativity to be very undervalued. Um, you know, it's had so many kind of connotations for people and a lot of people will say, well, you know, how can I be creative? Because I'm not a poet, mm. I'm not a painter, I'm not a writer. So mm. how can I be creative? What do you say to people who might mm. say something like that? Well, what I like to say is that we are all creators. We're all creative in some way or another. And we just have to apply that mode of being because it's a mode of being creativity. You know, it's it's not any particular art form um, and it doesn't even have to be art per se. Creativity can be the way that you raise your child. It could be the way that you put a meal together with love and intention. It could be gardening, you know, it could be the way you run your business. We're creative in everything that we do. We just don't think about it that way. Yeah. And so we all have some way that we're being creative in the world and we just have to tap into that. What do you, what do you do for, you know, when you're feeling creative, what do you do for inspiration? I mean, you're a mm -hmm. poet, you're a painter, you're a writer, you know, which is kind of, you know, polymath you know you're multi-talented you can turn to any one of those well i mean i find inspiration all over the place continually there are times and this is part of the alchemical process that i write about there are times when i can't find it when it just doesn't seem to be there when there's a sort of um dead feeling you know mm -hmm. and I've understood that as a very necessary part of the process and to embrace it rather than fight against it. Um, and that's very helpful to see it that way, you know, rather than begin to identify with it and like, oh, I've lost my creativity. I've lost all inspiration. It's gonna be like this forever. But just seeing it as like a necessary rest period and an opportunity to go inward. But at other times, inspiration can be like a flood, you know, and I'll be having dreams that connect with things that are happening in my waking life and a symbol that pops up multiple times over a few few days that is really prominent and it's calling to me to kind of investigate it and understand what it means for me. Um, I receive a lot of inspiration through nature and spending time outside and just observing the clouds and the light and the animals, the birds, insects, um, plants, that is an endless source of inspiration to me. Um, yeah. how, do you, how do you, you know, if you're inspired by something, how do you decide whether you're going to paint a picture or you're going mm -hmm. to write a poem or you're going to, you know, write an article about it? Mm -hmm. How does that no, work? It really depends. A painting is, it takes a lot of time and a lot of energy and something has to be like pretty overwhelming for me to to want to paint it and you know sometimes when i paint it's a spontaneous process because i just feel something that wants to be expressed i don't know what it is and so that's a sort of surreal process that um i just allow things to come out as they want to without trying to filter them but other times i'll have a some sort of 
set of symbols or things that seem related that I'm trying to understand as a whole. And as I contemplate them over time, they come together and they sort of fuse and then I can see um, how they fit together in a visual composition. And so that's another way that things come together in a painting. But for things that are more like directly emotional, I tend to write songs um, because it allows me to just express that emotion in the moment and get it out. And um, whereas a painting is gonna take me months, you know, to finish. So that's a sort of a commitment. A song, I can play at any time when I'm feeling that way and I can just let it out. Do you sing for, in public? Um, not for many years. It has not been a focus since I've been working on the books. And But this year I have been getting back into it. So you may very well see some music in the future. We'll see. Mm. I'm always interested in, um, you know, we see a little child. Um, you know, it could be any child. Uh, and we have no idea what is in that child and who they are going to become. I mean, you look at, say, a picture of Oprah Winfrey as a little girl. Nobody would imagine that the little girl in that photograph is going to turn out to be her. You know, you come from a military family. Your family has travelled all over. You've lived in many places. Mm -hmm. Do you think that your family had any inkling that you would grow up and do what you're doing? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know that they did. Maybe. I mean, I was very artistic as a child, um, even though I didn't end up going to school for art and I didn't plan on being an artist until much later. Um, and also, you know, read a lot. And my mom liked to describe me as cerebral as a toddler um, because I would line up all of my toys like in perfect order. So maybe they had some inkling. I'm not sure. But, but you didn't. <laughs> No, certainly not. <laughs> no, no. And, and what do they say now? Uh, well, my mom passed uh, a number of years ago, and I think my dad is very proud. Um, and, yeah, yeah. Because, you know, sometimes you, you meet parents that are completely bemused. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> how did that happen? <laughs> Where did it come from? Well, my mom was very artistic and our house was full of her art. Um, also my uncle and everyone on my mom's side of the family, they're all artists and creators. And so that was a big influence on me. And yeah, even yeah. though um, for some reason it wasn't encouraged to become an artist, it's, I find this very odd, but it just was never talked about, never encouraged. But yet I had all that influence as a child. So I'm grateful for that. Do you have any more books? coming up? Possibly. I'm working on a lot of writing and it very well may turn into a book. Um, it's probably going to be a few years, but I'm currently writing about the 36 astrological decans and posting about it on my Patreon blog, and which is available for just a dollar a month. A very good deal if you want to read about the decans. And it's just right now my research and kind of intuitive understanding of what each of these uh, divisions of the zodiac mean and what they might, uh, what kind of energies people might be feeling during these periods of time. Each mm. one's about 10 days. So each zodiac sign is divided into three decans. And it's super interesting. Um, there's been images described and illustrated over the centuries by different astrologers that are very surreal. And looking at all of them um, as a whole, some of them are very different, but you can find the threads and kind of tease out the meaning of each decan by looking at the whole and how people have perceived these over the centuries. Mm. I want to go back to your 10 best list before we close. And mm -hmm. if you could meet and have dinner with any of those authors, which one would it be? Well, um, Hermes would be pretty amazing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. And I, I have met Brian Cote Noir, and of course I've met Dr. Leslie Korn. Um, so who else? Well, Carl Jung, I would have to say Carl Jung. Uh, yeah, 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 I think so. Yeah. Hermes and Carl together. Yeah. Yeah. That would be yeah, a very they're... interesting meal. Yeah. <laughs> I would yeah. enjoy that. Yeah. I'd enjoy that. So if ever you have a sense that it might be happening, please invite me. 
I certainly will. Marlene, Marlena, seven Bremner. Thank you so much for joining us today and adding your 10 best list of spiritual books to the No BS Spiritual Book Club's library of recommendations. It's been a joy to talk to you. Oh, it's been my pleasure. Thank you so much, Sandy. Oh, you're so welcome. So Marlena Seven Bremner, better known as Seven, her 10 best list can be found at the no bsspiritualbookclub.com and I would encourage you to go over there and read it because the descriptions so beautifully written and much more is expressed in them than we've had time to share today. So you can find it there. You can also learn more about her paintings, poetry and books at her website, marlena 7 Bremner.com. That's it for this week. I'm Sandy Sedgbeer, and I'll be back with another edition of the No BS Spiritual Book Club's live streaming interview series at the same time next week. Till then, it's goodbye from me, and thank you again to Seven. Thank you. Thank you, Sandy.